sports fans. It is March 2024, and uh, hail dear old state and get your cowbells out. we got to keep it quiet because yeah. we're in a library here. <laughs> but uh, it is time to talk about some college sports uh, on Hale State Debate. Uh, and that's because the March 2024 topic is uh, resolved. In the United States, college student athletes should be classified as employees of their educational institution. Uh, as always, uh, we want the video to be useful to you. So, of course, we're going to have the sources and timestamps in the description below. If it is useful, as always, like, subscribe, tell a friend, the usual YouTube stuff. I'm um, really excited about this for me personally. It's, uh, it's a topic about uh, labor and employment law. It's a topic about sports. If only we had a former labor and employment lawyer uh, and two <laughs> students at a large SEC institution with major sports to talk about this. Uh, it turns out we it's a do. Shame. Oh, <laughs> hey, okay. Um, so uh, at any rate, uh, we got a lot to cover. This is a surprisingly deep topic. So we're going to do um, some uh, initial thoughts. So Tanner, you first. Sure, yeah. I think this is a very appropriate topic considering that it's in March, you know, March Madness, right, right with right. college sports. So I think it's very appropriate for y'all to talk about this. Uh, regarding content, though, I think this is going to be a very interesting one and where generalities is going to make this case or break it. So you mm -hmm. got to know your case through and through. You got to understand what the stats mean because we're talking about like employment stuff. So like you got to know exactly what you're talking about when it comes to sources because these generalities are going to lose you the case. So be very particular about what you're choosing and know what your source is. Um, I think the con has the upper hand on this debate due to how the pro has proved that all collegiate student athletes should be classified as employees of their educational institutions. So I think it's going to be a very high burden to prove for the, uh, uh, for the pro. So I think the con is going to have an upper hand there. So if you're the con, uh, you got to poke at this. you got to make sure uh, that you can make this your ground because it is your ground. One um, size does not fit all. Exactly yeah. right. One yeah. size does not fit, fit all. And if you're the pro, you have, uh, you have to have this underlying thesis that the judge can understand, so just make it known. But overall, I think it's going to be very interesting. Uh, I think uh, you, you got to make sure you understand your statistics, and uh, the generalities are just going to kill your case. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I wrote this when I was in a bad mood, so it's not great. <laughs> but I will say, generally speaking, it's a sports topic. It'll be more fun than your other topics where you're talking about, like, extremely bleak things, about, like, the world, you know, uh, warming over or people dying in war, things like that. Somebody what, will link this to climate change. Yeah, they will. And, and they the will. Nuclear war. <laughs> but what I wrote was, it's, it's fairly apparent to me that this is basically a filler topic. Mm. Um, there's hardly any literature on most of the impacts that students would want to talk about or even could talk about. Most of your sources are going to literally be coming from the horse's mouth on this issue, whether it be from the NCAA or the universities themselves. And it's going to be, I think, pretty messy if you let it. So do uh, uh, so just try not to just say things in round. You know, actually link to these things. Find as much evidence as you can. It's, there's not a whole lot out there, but try your very best to have you know very clear and succinct pieces of argumentation that, that are actually substantiated. Okay, well, I completely disagree with that. <laughs> I like this topic a lot. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's something that judges can relate to. It's something that debaters can relate to. Everybody has an opinion about sports, or most people do, and most people who have an opinion about sports have an opinion about college sports. But it's also got a fun overlay of like economics and labor law and things that can, you, you know, you can have little variables. You can know more than your opponent about, for example, what the Fair Labor Standards Act says about who is an employee or the National Labor Relations Act. So you can beat them on knowledge. You can have a little bit more knowledge about like economic theory and like what it means to adequately compensate somebody. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, I think that there is generally a strong core argument for the pro, which is about unfairness and exploitation. But I agree with Tanner uh, that there are also some strategic responses for the con, like one size doesn't fit all. The rule that you would make for the football team at Ohio State or the football team at Alabama generating millions and millions of dollars in revenue is not necessarily the same rule you would have for the women's lacrosse team at a Division III private college in New England. They're very, very different operations. And the idea that the same thing applies to all of them is a challenging one. And so there's an opportunity to talk about unintended consequences, an opportunity to talk about better alternatives. So yeah, I mean, pun intended, I, I am a fan. I think, it's a, uh, I think it's a good topic, but I can absolutely see how in rounds where people don't know what they're talking about, who haven't done the research, who don't understand the, the legal arguments, and the economics of it, it could devolve into some pretty boring stuff. But that's why we're here, right? That's why you're watching the video. So we're going to follow the usual outline. We're going to talk about a little bit about definitions, background, and framing in the first section. Then we'll talk about pro arguments. Then we will talk about con arguments. And then, gentlemen, we will come back and do some final thoughts.
Okay, so we kick things off as usual. That's funny because we said kick things off. Like we don't realize how many sports <laughs> metaphors we have in our language. I did not intend that. So we kick things off as usual with a little bit of background on how college sports work in the status quo and an overview of what it might mean in legal terms and in practical terms if student athletes were considered employees. And to start with, I just want to get this out of the way. Probably the single best return on investment from your time on this topic in terms of reading just to get a general sense of what's going on on this topic is this piece by Michael McCann who is a professor of sports law at the University of New Hampshire Law School. McCann is actually a guy I've met a few times. I've been on some panel discussions with like uh, about uh, college legal stuff, some of which has to do with sports, Title IX, things like that. Uh, the reason being he used to teach law here in Mississippi at the Mississippi College School of Law, so I met him there. He really does know his stuff. He's a nationally recognized expert. Uh, and this piece is really great because what it does is it boils down key questions about treating college athletes as employees into these very practical bite-sized responses in a format that's easy for you and easy for judges to understand. But unlike a lot of these sort of FAQ articles that you might read, it's not written by just some random person. It's written by a very highly regarded law professor, arguably one of the prominent experts on uh, on sports law in the entire country. So you can absolutely use it to cut cards and read them directly in the round because it comes from a credible source. So for example, you know, imagine you're the pro and the con comes in arguing that treating college athletes as employees would mean like every extracurricular participant like the choir or the drama club or God forbid the debate team uh, would have to get paid. Well, you know, you need a response to that, but if you have read the McCann piece, you have this handy little card here from a serious expert that explains, no, that's wrong, there would be multiple variables. You might have to get a little bit more than just this card, but you would have a very succinct, plain language response about why that's not true. And in the piece by McCann, there are 25 of these FAQ style answers on everything from like what the current legal challenges to uh, student athlete status look like to whether uh, paid athletes could be fired for poor performance. So just make sure you take a read. It only probably takes about 15 minutes to read the whole thing, if that. Uh, but we just wanted to get that out there front and center. And now let's step back and take a look at the big picture, starting with the history of student athlete labor in America. So we don't have time to cover the very elaborate history around the classification and treatment of student athletes in the United States. Suffice it to say, it goes back a ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, college athletics are, are very different in the United States than in nearly all other countries in the world. Uh, for over a century, college sports have been major entertainment events attracting thousands of fans and millions of dollars in revenue, uh, effectively serving as the minor leagues for pro leagues, and in some parts of the country, like here in Mississippi, right. effectively as a substitute for the pro leagues. Right, we don't have professional teams in Mississippi, so Mississippi State, Ole Miss, to a lesser extent, Jackson State, Southern Miss, mm -hmm. those serve as the sports entertainment for the mm -hmm. state, and they're, they're, they make a lot of revenue. We even have the Bulldogs. We have, yeah, we have our own, you know, paraphernalia and imagery, <laughs> and it, it's very meaningful in the mm -hmm. lives of millions of people, right? Mm -hmm. so. uh, and, and you don't see this in Europe or Asia or literally anywhere else. In those countries, top athletes graduate from high school mm -hmm. and go straight into pro development leagues. Colleges will have club teams and, offer com uh, and often compete against each other, but not in front of tens of thousands of screaming fans and not for billion dollar TV contracts. And it, it is weird in the United States, besides the NBA and MLB, Pretty much every league requires you to go to college yeah. to actually enter athletics, which and is you, really and odd. And the NBA used to. You know, yeah, it was, yeah. It was basically a requirement. So I, I don't know why they got rid of that, but I, I think that the European model is obviously better. We don't have to spend millions of taxpayer dollars to, to fund you know, the club teams in Europe. So given all the attention and money being attracted, it shouldn't surprise us that throughout the 20th century, the argument that college athletes are employees has come up multiple times. It's nothing new. The story of how this argument evolved is summed up really well in a 2006 article by Robert and Amy McCormick at Michigan State University called The Myth of the Student Athlete, the College Athlete as Employee. And while it's a little dated and doesn't cover all the most recent developments, this is a fantastic article to get the backstory on the debate about student athletes as employees. So I definitely recommend that you read it, but it's pretty long, so maybe direct you to the relevant part, you might turn to page 83 where you learn this. In 1953, in the University of Denver versus Nimeth, the Colorado Supreme Court upheld a determination by the State Industrial Commission that Ernest Nimeth, a football player at the University of Denver, was an employee within the meaning of Colorado Workers' Compensation Statute. Thus, the university was obligated to provide workers' compensation for his football injuries. 
And by the way, the compensation in this case was to pay the widow of a former football player who was killed during a football game, which raises a whole host of other issues. But anyway, the article continues, quote, stunned by the Nimitz decision, the NCAA responded by coining the term, quote, student athlete and requiring its exclusive use thereafter. By emphasizing the identity of athletes as students, the NCAA uh, endeavored to diminish any tendency to characterize them as quote unquote employees. As then NCAA directive, or executive director Walter Byers later wrote, another quote, the threat was the dreaded notion that the NCAA athletes could be identified as employees by state industrial commissions and the courts. We crafted the term student athlete and soon it was embedded in all NCAA rules and the interpretations as a mandated substitute for such words as players and athletes. We told college publicists to speak of college teams, not football or basketball clubs, as a word common to the pros. Aha, so there you have it. <laughs> the whole idea of student athletes was a marketing ploy, right. uh, a transparent attempt by the NCAA to distract from the free labor and revenue it was extracting from young people. The term student athlete was such a cynical attempt to distract regulators and the public that, there, that there's even an argument that the term itself is oppressive and should no longer be used. We will link an article by Molly Harry of Diverse Education 2020. She says this, Today the majority of revenue producing athletes in the sport of football and men's basketball are black. They are coached mostly by white men. The man who coined the term student athlete was also a white man. So using the term student athlete perpetuates the ideals of amateurism while further preventing a pay-for-play model. She continues, in spite of this history and the fact that the, men who, the, that the man who created the term came to condemn it, scholars, practitioners, members of the media, faculty, coaches, and athletes themselves continue to use. However, research demonstrates that priming or subconsciously cooing athletes with the term student athletes result in a decreased academic performance. So then the question becomes, why do we continue to use the term? Right. So now the resolution isn't specifically about whether we should use the term student athletes, but I think it's worth being aware of just how loaded the term is. Right. In fact, I'm a little surprised uh, the NSDA used it, given how sensitive they are to language and resolutions lately. Yeah. We just had a Lincoln Douglas topic that used the term West Asia and North Africa instead of the Middle East right. because of how politically loaded the term Middle East is, for example. Yeah, and in a more progressive circuit, like I can definitely imagine, say, a con team running a critique type argument, basically saying something like, yeah, we totally agree that not paying student athletes is bad, but the resolution reinforces that mindset by using outdated uh, oppressive language in the form of student athlete instead of something you know better like students participating in athletics and therefore you should vote against the resolution for that reason. Now I don't think that's common. I don't think critiques are common in PF, but they do happen now. They do happen in certain circuits and I can definitely see uh, some of these K arguments as you kids call them uh, in more progressive circuits. So that is something I would just be aware of. I don't think you're going to see it in many rounds, but it's something you should be aware of. So anyway, that is a way too short background on student athletes not being employees. It's a really interesting story. You should read the whole article from Michigan State to get the history on it. But now we turn to the practical side of the topic and ask, how do we determine who is classified as an employee in the United States? And to answer this question, we have to look to federal law. Now, to be fair, there are other definitions of the word employee in, for example, like state law that come from academics and economists and things like that. But because the resolution specifies the scope as in the United States, it strongly implies that we need like a single binding definition of what an employee is across the country. And that single answer can't come from state law. It can't really come from, you know, academic opinions unless you want to run a plan or something. It really can only come from federal law. So the question is, how does federal law define an employee? Well, unfortunately, as you might expect, because lawyers were involved, uh, there isn't a single straightforward answer. The definition of who is and isn't an employee depends on which federal law we're talking about. So different federal employment laws confer different rights on employees, so they might have uh, slightly different definitions of the word employee to reflect that. So for example, you could have an individual person, a single individual person who as an employee for purposes of one law, like the National Labor Relations Act, which lets you form a union, but not an employee for the purposes of another law, like say the Americans with Disabilities Act, which protects against disability discrimination and things like that. There's a really good article on this from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is a government agency, so it comes directly from the source, that explains all this called, what is an employee? The answer depends on the federal law. It really lays this out in a lot of detail. We will link to it, 
Uh, but it's probably more than you need for purposes of a PF round. It's a little dated from 2002, but I can tell you as somebody who practiced labor and employment law, these definitions are still accurate today. But uh, at any rate, the main part of it you want to see is this chart uh, that gives you the, the, the basic three tests that we use uh, to determine whether someone is an employee under federal law. And to make a long story short, while we do have this hybrid test down here at the bottom that's kind of a mixture of the first two, the two real tests we use in federal law most of the time for employee status are these first two in the chart. The first one is called the control test. That is whether the alleged employer controls the alleged employee's work process, like can tell them what to do during the day. And the second one is the dependency test, sometimes in this chart called the economic realities test. And that is whether under just the economic realities that exist in the relationship, is the alleged employee dependent on the alleged employer for continued employment. Yeah, and we use these definitions because generally speaking, uh, labor and employment laws recognize that employees are in a more vulnerable position right. relative to their employer than just two parties negotiating at arm's length. Mm -hmm. If two big companies try to negotiate a deal and it falls through, no big deal. They can just walk away and be entirely fine. They can go and find another party to negotiate with, whatever. But if an individual takes a job for a big company or if a student athlete signs to play uh, a, a sport for a university, they in some ways become dependent. Uh, they don't normally have the ability to just up and walk away or assert their rights in the same way that a non-employee might. And so we pass employment laws that give these employees things like the right to form a union or the right to a minimum wage or the right to avoid harassment. And that's just the basic logic uh, behind employee status in the law generally. You take the job and the employer has leverage over you, so the law needs to help you even things out a bit. Now luckily for the pro, I think that basically college student athletes meet both of the control tests, both the control test and the dependency test. Mm -hmm. Coaches and administrators have absolute or almost total control over how athletes practice, play, and, and even study. Uh, and student athletes are very much dependent on their schools for their scholarships, training, and other opportunities related to their sport. Uh, they aren't just you know, at, you know, independent contractors who can work for multiple companies at once or just pick up and start working for someone else tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, people talk about how in recent years the new NCAA transfer rules let people transfer back and forth between schools like once a year. But even that, which is far more lenient than the old rule was, you still can't just decide, well, I'm playing on Duke's basketball team now. I, next week, I, I don't like Duke anymore. <laughs> I want to go play for North Carolina. At best, you might play for North Carolina next year, right? And that's a, that's a really long time to wait on something that y you could potentially be generating your livelihood and your income from, right? Right. And these guys aren't playing for fun. They're not like, well, you know, I'm tired this week, so I won't be showing up to the... No, right. like they're going to have to show up and practice and play or else they can't go to school or they can't eat or they can't get housing. So as we'll talk about later on the pro, there's a strong argument that classifying student athletes as employees doesn't actually involve any change in the law. Instead, it just involves acknowledging that these student athletes really have met the test for being employees all along. They've just been denied compensation and other rights because of this legal fiction student that they're not, athletes. yeah, that they're not working and therefore not employees. Yeah, I will actually say, I'm not going to link to it in this because it, it's a little crude, as you might imagine. There's actually a there's a there's a segment on South Park from a couple of like a decade ago. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, where Cartman yeah. comes in and talks about student athletes. Now, if you want to look up South Park student athletes, you can watch it. It actually compares the system <laughs> kind of crassly to like slavery. Yeah. We're not going to include that here, but if you wanted to see just how mocked and derided the idea of student athletes is, again, South Park student athlete, and you'll see what we're talking. That's about. the one where he like he finds out they're using the term, and he's like, Oh, oh I'm going to start. Yeah, yes. I get your tone. Right. Uh, uh, but now at this point you're probably thinking, you know, wow, this sounds great for the pro, and, and it does, but don't get too excited because we still need to talk about our second big question, which is... As a practical matter, what would change if student athletes were treated as employees? That's a big thing you have to know. So here again, the answer is it depends on which law you apply. As we just briefly mentioned, being an employee confers different rights under different laws, as you could probably imagine. So for example, under the National Labor Relations Act, the NLRA, uh, being considered an employee means that you and your coworkers can collectively bargain together as a union to get what you want. Uh, you want things uh, that like better wages or better benefits, shorter hours, so on. You could just imagine, 1920s, right? Unionize. Uh, this is what employees meant uh, in the recent decision by the National Labor Relations Board, or the NLRB, uh, in the Dartmouth College case. Dartmouth. Just, Dar Dartmouth. No, I would sorry. call them Dartmouth. Yeah. Dartmouth. Dartmouth. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, y'all. If you're for, if, if you have any connection, don't to Dartmouth. apologize. <laughs> So Dartmouth, <laughs> Dartmouth College. We're going to call them Dart, Dartmouth for the rest of the video. <laughs> so sorry, guys. 
But yeah, so according to Dartmouth College case, said just a couple weeks ago in February 2024, uh, the NLRB dis uh, decided just. Uh, disputes uh, about things like recognizing labor unions and recently it decided that the Dartmouth men's basketball team were employees of Dartmouth College and consequently had a right to form a union to negotiate better terms right. with the college. And if you could sell it to the judge, this might be a strategic framework for the pro to use. Maybe you can make an observation that we're just going to focus on the NLRA and the right to form a union. Yeah, if it's me, as we'll talk about later on the pro, I would like to argue that employee just means you're an employee under the NLRA. That means you can collectively bargain and try to form a union and like what's ever wrong with people bargaining. But we'll talk about that later. Mm -hmm. So now all that said, other federal definitions of employee can be a little bit more challenging for the pro. For example, if you are an employee within the meaning of the Fair Labor Standards Act or FLSA, you are entitled to a minimum wage and overtime pay, which could be extremely expensive and extremely challenging for small colleges uh, fielding large teams of student athletes to afford. And this is what's going on right now in a case called Johnson versus NCAA, which is currently pending in the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. This is a federal appellate court right below the Supreme Court based in Pennsylvania. In this case, some NCAA student athletes sued claiming they are employees under the FLSA and are therefore entitled to be paid for the time that they spend practicing and playing their sport. If you want a little background on that case, we'll include a link to an article by Richard Johnson and Sports Illustrated in 2023, but as you can see here, the plaintiff student athletes say they should be paid for the time they spend in practice and competition. The plaintiffs assert that they are no different than a student ticket taker or a student library worker. They work while in school and therefore should be paid for that. So if you're the con, this approach is maybe a more strategic framing for you. You want to argue that no, 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 we're not just letting them form a union, uh, however innocuous that might seem. You want to argue that even just paying them the minimum wage and then time and a half overtime for like hours over 40 and they are all doing more than 40 hours a week, right? This would be disastrous and probably impossible for most colleges. And that's because, as we'll talk about later, most colleges and universities don't make a profit off of athletics. They lose money. So while it's easy to focus on the highest profile schools, the elite programs like Alabama, Oregon, Ohio State, and so on, the reality is that the vast majority of the 1,100 schools in the NCAA and even other other colleges like junior colleges, uh, in, uh, NAIA schools and things like that, they are not wealthy elites. They are smaller colleges and universities and according to them, right, if you ask them, if the bill for running, let's say, a Division II lacrosse team that plays in front of 25 people every time they play, if it's going to be tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay every single person on that team for every single minute they practice or are at a game, they're just going to have to shut the program down and that'll end up taking away dozens of scholarships and educational opportunities. It'll be a dead way loss for people who could have had a good college education, right? So anyway, as you can see, there is some strategic thinking to be done by both sides about what the practical consequences of being an employee are, and they stem from which federal law you're using to define employee and what that means as a practical matter. Now, even if you don't use the specific approaches in the Dartmouth NLRB, Dartmouth NLRB <laughs> case, or the right. Johnson FLSA case, you know, regardless, and regardless of which side you're on, you need to be able to articulate in your world in your case, what do, as a practical matter, what changes when these people are considered employees? Uh, what changes when you vote pro? Because a lot of the links to impacts heavily depend on which version of employee we're talking about. And the answer to this is going to be really important in the round. So anyway, that is some high level background on the topic. Next, let's jump to the fun stuff, the actual arguments on the pro and then on the con. And now we get into it, the pro arguments. Uh, this uh, going right into the first one, which is going to be very indispensable one. This is one that's going to be very important. But the first one is going to be student athletes perform labor that generates revenue. This is going to be uh, pretty much a baseline. This is an essential element of pretty much every pro case. Right. Uh, the idea that student athletes are not just going out and playing sports for fun on a college dime. They're doing work. They are doing hard work. If you've ever seen any promotional ideas for like college sports, like these people are sweating their tails off. They're doing work. All right. They're performing labor that generates revenue for their colleges, in some cases a little, in some cases hundreds of millions of dollars. But either way, uh, they're working at least as much as most people with full-time jobs with no direct compensation to show for it. And to start that argument, uh, we can look to Tommy Beer in Forbes of 2020. He actually, he talks about this and he kind of summarizes uh, Greg Garthwhite, uh, funny name, I don't know, uh, but he's in the National Bureau of Economic Research. And he states uh, that the top NCAA Division I schools earn approximately $8.5 billion in annual revenue. 
with 58% of that, uh, that's revenue coming directly from men's football and men's basketball programs. But less than 7% of that revenue generated by those two sports goes to its athletes in the form of scholarships and stipends for living expenses. Under the collective bargaining agreements in place in the NFL and NBA, the professional athletes in those two leagues receive approximately 50% of the revenue generated by their athletic activities in the form of salary, which is so much more than was in college. Right. Um, the study estimates that if men's basketball and football players in most prestigious conferences split 50% of revenue equally, each football player would receive $360,000 per year and each basketball player would earn nearly $500,000 annually. And he goes on and on and tells you these gigantic numbers. But uh, we, to put it simply, the money, for, the money from college football and basketball are not going back to these people who are generating it. The NFL and the NBA have collective bargaining agreements in place uh, to get their athletes about 50% or half the money that the league generates. So, but they aren't doing that. Right now, like 7% is only going back to college athletes. So that, as you can see, is so much smaller than what's happening in the, pro, in the pros. So if you need a source on that, uh, there's one from Yahoo Finance in 2023 from Kurt Badenhausen. Badenhausen? Badenhausen. Badenhausen. Yeah, Badenhausen. Yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they write about this. They say that the NBA and its players union agreed on a new collective bargaining agreement this month. Uh, players also picked up a few wins in the negotiations. So they're having their voices heard, whereas colleges aren't right now. Uh, in the new CBA, players are expected to receive 51% of BRI, which is basketball-related income, throughout the agreement. Uh, players are currently projected to earn between a total of $45 billion and $50 billion in salaries and benefits during the seven-year term of the CBA. So this is what it looks like in the big time. Uh, revenue, uh, high revenue sports where the players can negotiate with their employers. They're getting tons of money. Where there are employees and have the ability to negotiate. Right, they right. can actually negotiate for the things that they can, they, they're earning. Uh, but as we said, in college football and basketball, the two sports that make up 58% of the revenue coming in, and, and for all college sports, student athletes only get 7% back and of what they actually produce in the form of scholarships and living stipends. So that's just drastically uh, a separation there. And to be fair, for many uh, of the very best among these athletes, the scholarships has little or no value to them because they plan to be professional athletes. Like what is marketing or what is, you know, like if I'm if I'm doing college sports, like college like college football. Like what is what is your interest in, in learning about accounting or history or art? I mean, it might be intellectually interesting, but it doesn't really have any economic value to you unless you're going to actually go be an accountant or yeah. go teach art or teach history or something along those lines. And if you plan to be a professional athlete, there's really no value. It's just one more thing you have to do. In fact, college athletes likely work more than their professional counterparts, given how much control colleges exert over their lives. They don't just have to show up to class. They have to see the nutritionist. They have to see the tutors. They have to go to practices which run extremely long. So it's not just the, you know, the daily life of an everyday student. And I can tell you from working at an SEC institution as an administrator, I don't work in athletics, but I work with athletics, these student athletes are carefully monitored. They're meeting with tutors, they're going over assignments, they're meeting with nutritionists, they're meeting with personal trainers in the off season. They're often being told by their coaches that if they want to succeed, like if you want to be a starter next year, you want to have a chance to go pro, you need to go be competing on your own time in the off season. You need to play in summer leagues, you need to be training full time. So it's way, way, way more than just the near full time job of the practicing and the playing and things like that. Right, and, and this is all summed up nicely uh, by the NCSA college recruiting. They say, quote, uh, on college campuses, amateur Division I student athletes are expected to work much longer hours. The premier collegiate student athletes is, uh, essentially have two full-time jobs, student and athlete, you know, maybe in intuited by the name. To meet the demands of both, many Division I student athletes end up committing nearly 60 hours per week to school and sports, leaving very little time for anything else. So basically, the pro will argue uh, that these athletes are bringing huge amounts of money to their university through their hard work, through hours and hours on it, I mean, literally working full-time jobs, and they are making 7% of the revenue that they're getting when their professional counterparts, who are working less hours, are getting half of the revenue that they actually produce for their leagues. And with us talking about percentages of revenue, you might be wondering, and your judges might be wondering as well, how much money are we actually talking about here? Well, to answer that, the, here's this from Andrew, Andrew Zimablist, what a name, mm -hmm. uh, from PBS in 2023. He says that, quote, Division I athletics generated $15.8 billion with a B dollars in revenue in 2019, according to the National Collegiate Athletic, uh, athletic Association, the NCAA, which regulates student athletics among 
1,100 colleges and universities. So in a world where student athletes could bargain like employees, you'd expect them to see something like $8 billion a year. Half of the 16. Yeah, which is a fair amount. Mm -hmm. But in the real world, uh, it, it's a tiny fraction of that. It's 7%. And a lot of that 7% is going into scholarships that don't really even benefit them and that aren't even going to every single athlete. Mm -hmm. Shoes, other items like locker rooms, things that they can't eat, things that they can't use, things that otherwise are not going to benefit them or that are going to propel them in their lives in the long term. I can tell you I've met student athletes athletes here at Mississippi State who actually complain about like how much stuff they throw at them. <laughs> like how, how many pieces of clothing and shoes and things like that because they're not allowed to pay them, right? And, and currently in the status quo, it, they would much rather have a check, right? right? Money that they can go spend or send to their family than the 27th piece of swag that they get from their program. Yeah, and they wouldn't be spending like the $100,000 fair market value salary that they're getting at the local bookstore no. buying like weird novelty <laughs> mugs or something. <laughs> Like they would go and buy a house or something. Yeah. They'd get a car. Or down paying groceries. Yeah. Now there are a couple of caveats that we need to address here as we're talking about people not getting compensated in anticipation of some responses that the con is probably going to make. And they are number one, most athletic departments don't generate a net profit. So the con is going to respond to all these things about people not getting paid by saying, well, but these athletic departments aren't profitable. And that's true, but we'll address it. And the second one we need to address is that the new rules about name, image, and likeness, or NIL, might allow these athletes to get paid without being employees. So we as the pro need to be able to respond to those arguments, so let's do that. Let's briefly talk about them. So first, what do we say to the con when they point out that most NCAA member schools lose money on athletics? And we will cover the data on this later later on in the con, but for now, trust me, all but about 25 of the 1,100 NCAA schools actually do lose money on sports. So how can these athletes complain about not getting paid if most of their teams and most of their schools are losing money on what they're doing? Some people argue that these programs only lose money because their coaches get paid too much, but that's actually not true. There's actually a really good piece by Dr. Scott Hirko that we're going to cite on the con that shows even if you exclude coach salaries, the number of profitable NCAA schools only goes up from 25 to 37. So that's actually not the right response. The real reason that losing money doesn't change the equation is because lots of businesses and lots of subsections of businesses and certainly most government agencies, which is what public universities are, lose money, but you still have to pay the employees for the value that they add. For example, I, right, I work in the legal compliance department of a big university. Our office does not generate any revenue. We don't sell tickets. We don't write tickets, which is the main way of generating revenue here at Mississippi State, but I, you know, you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> we don't bring in any revenue, but we all get paid a salary because we add value to the university by making sure that we're following and complying with important laws. Similarly, the vast majority of athletics departments don't generate a net profit, but they still create major value for the university. If nothing else, they serve as a huge televised marketing department. And it is by far the most effective marketing that most colleges can buy, as demonstrated in this piece from Brittany Renee Mays and Emily Giambalvo in the Washington Post in 2018. And what this is about is the correlation between major athletic victories and a spike in enrollment applications at major universities. We're not going to go through all of them, and the correlation isn't absolute, but if you look at these charts, what you're going to see is a pretty consistent trend that when schools like, you know, Connecticut win the uh, basketball title or Kentucky wins a basketball title or Alabama wins a football title or here Florida Gulf Coast, you know, made it to the Sweet 16, a smaller school made it to the Sweet 16, we're seeing significant spikes in enrollment. Right? To quote the article, a college football game can serve as a four-hour national commercial showcasing a piece of that school's student experience. In a 2017 survey, Clemson asked admitted students how influential the school's athletic athletic success in 2016, when, the year when they won the national title, was to their decision to apply. 30% said it was moderately, very, or extremely influential, and another 25% said it was slightly influential. So to make a long story short, whether an athletic department generates a net profit or not misses the point, the pro would argue. Student athletes are working for the university as like marketing employees, promoting the brand just like an employee in the marketing department, an employee in the compliance department, or whatever. You don't have to make money to add value. The second objection Khan might raise is student athletes already get paid indirectly via name, image, and likeness rules, or NIL rules. 
regardless of which side you're debating on, you do need to understand what name, image, likeness, NIL payments are. Basically, if you haven't heard of this before, these are payments from parties outside the university to a student athlete to use their name, image, or likeness to like promote a business or a product or something else. They're basically endorsement deals, right? So for example, if a basketball player at Mississippi State signs an agreement to make a commercial for a local car dealership and gets paid $10,000, that is a name, image, and likeness payment. Now for a long time, these kinds of deals were banned under NCAA rules. They were seen as not being amateur athletics. Amateur athletics where the coaches make millions of dollars, right? <laughs> but since 2019, that rule has gradually been eroded until it was finally abandoned in 2021. There is a very nice, succinct summary and a timeline of how NIL came to be and how the old rules uh, ended in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution in 2022, which we will link to. Not going to read it, but I do suggest that you read it. But basically, some con teams might argue that treating student athletes as employees is unnecessary because they can already get paid via these NIL deals. And in fact, some student athletes are getting paid very handsomely with star football players and basketball players, uh, like I think you said Caleb Williams, mm -hmm. I think, getting six and even seven figure deals. Boosters of these big programs are getting together into so-called NIL collectives to raise money and make deals with recruits and effectively pay them to come to their favorite school. So the pro needs to be able to explain why is this not enough? Why is the status quo where you can get NIL deals, why is that not enough? Why do we need to make them employees? And I think there are at least three answers to this. So the first one is most NIL deals involve trivial amounts of money. So for every Caleb Williams making millions of dollars, there are thousands and thousands of student athletes who make a trivial amount. This is from Bill Carter in the Sports Business Journal in 2023. And what he says is, according to the NIL marketplace, Open Doors, the average compensation for student athletes on their platform was about $1,300 per deal in year one of NIL. It should be clear that averages can be inflated due to very large deals. So that might mean that the, that the median number is actually lower for many student athletes. So this is a trivial amount of money in comparison to the amount that a lot of pe these people are working. Second, again, we'll come back to this point, the fact that I can earn money outside of work doesn't mean my employer doesn't have to pay me. Mm -hmm. Right, if I am a great software engineer and that lets me do like a side hustle making YouTube videos about coding and they bring in some money, like they get popular and it blows up and I get some money about coding, that doesn't mean my employer can say, well, you know, you're already getting paid for your YouTube channel. I guess I don't have to pay you. That's just not how it works. If someone generates value for you, the fact that they can get it from somewhere else too does not in any way mitigate your obligation to pay them. And the third reason why NIL is not enough is it's heavily skewed to a handful of high revenue sports. This is kind of related to the first argument, but this is from Caitlin. Balasagan, I think, from uh, CNBC in 2022. And you can basically see what she's saying summed up in this chart, where you see almost 50% of all NIL compensation goes to football, almost 20% of the rest of it goes to men's basketball. So what we see here is that about 70% of the revenue goes to two sports totally inhabited by men. Now, if you look at the rest, you will see, yes, as the title of the article implies, women are in many of the sports also in the top 10. But if you look at how quickly the revenue trails off, it's a tiny fraction of what men are getting. And this chart doesn't show you the other 25 sports like soccer, golf, fencing, rowing, and other things that are all under 1% of the revenue. And that's kind of the problem with the NIL, right? It does almost nothing for these less high profile sports. Even if we agree that football players should be paid more, the pro would argue that athletes in fencing and rowing and golf are still doing work. They may not need to be paid as much as uh, football players, but they need to be paid something. And when you trail down you know, on, this, on this chart here to like less than 1%, they're not. They need to get paid wages. They need to be able to bargain collectively. They do not need to basically beg for scraps from wealthy donors under the NIL payment. And so with all of that out of the way, I think we can finally move to our next main argument, which is... Employee status puts bargaining on an even playing field. And so this is a shorter one, but I think it also it just generally is very intuitive. Uh, as we discussed earlier, the main benefit of employee status under the National Labor Relations Act, or the NLRA, is the ability to legally form a union and bargain collectively for your interests. Collective bargaining is the term we use when a union uses the collective leverage of many workers together who might go on strike, picket, etc. to force the employer to make greater concessions. And, and the entire idea behind collective bargaining is to put the workers on the same footing or at least more even footing with the employer. The employer acts as a single entity, which means it uses all its leverage when bargaining. It can threaten to shut down the business, fire all the workers, uh, etc. If workers act alone, they can be picked off individually. 
However, if the employer is forced to bargain collectively with the entire union, it can't exploit the weakest of individuals because they're all, of course, coming together under one sort of banner and, and asking for the same kinds of concessions. If, if, you know, it's one company versus the entire union, which means the battle is on more even terms. Mm -hmm. There's a succinct summary of how this applies to sports in this piece from Justia, where they say that owners of professional sports teams wield substantial power, both individually and as a group. To curb their power, professional athletes in most of the major American sports leagues have formed unions that devise collective bargaining agreements to protect the rights of athletes. And collective bargaining agreements are renegotiated re at inter intervals of several years. So these, you know, uh, players associations are obviously very successful in their own respective leagues, which is why we saw those figures earlier saying that they get about 50, half 50 of the revenue right. as compared to 7% of the revenue. And the same would happen if student athletes began to get paid as employees of their educational institution, or not even paid as employees, but just classified as employees. If they could you know, come together and bargain as a union, they would be able to get that at least some remnant of that 50% share that we were talking about earlier, which seems to be fair. The impact here is to tell the judge, why would you ever not want workers to be able to bargain on a level playing field? Right. Even if you don't personally think that college athletes should be paid much or at all, what could possibly be wrong with letting them come to the bargaining table and advocate for themselves as one, just like the university would? If their labor isn't worth much, then the negotiations won't get them much. But how is it ever wrong to let people bargain on even terms right. and just have a meeting of the minds? Also, this unionization is not as far flung as you may think it may be. According to Alex Kirshner, he's uh, writing in Global Sports Matters in 2022, he writes, quote, for decades, the idea of college athletes forming a labor union has been a far flung fantasy, but no longer. The National Collegiate Athlete, uh, Athletic Association, the NCAA, I hate the long term name, <laughs> long time prohibition of athlete compensation is currently crumbling in courts and state houses alike. And its concurrent refusal to recognize athletes as employees may be next. If that happens, college athletes would be able to form unions and engage in collective bargaining with their schools, conferences, and even the NCAA itself. And of course, they would get a ton of money from that. So the basic takeaway here is simple. Even if you as the judge aren't sure about the details like how much student athletes should earn or whether every single player should be paid or get other benefits, which you probably shouldn't provide because that'd be a little bit too specific, it might be a plan, you don't need to worry about those details. All we as the pro are advocating for is letting student athletes have the same right to organize as any other person that has a job on pretty much the face of the earth. And that's all you really need to know to vote pro. It's a simple, compelling message, and I think that you should try to work it into your case. Which brings us to our next main argument, which is... Consistency. We're treating athletes the same as everyone else. Many college students perform labor for the institutions they attend. Grad assistants, student workers in the bookstore, even student trainers in the athletic department. Right. Under federal, law and uh, federal labor and employment laws, all of them except student athletes must be paid for the work they do, which includes minimum wage, overtime pay, and the right to organize into a union. The National Labor Relations Board noted in February of 2024, uh, they talked about a specific... This is the Dartmouth case, by the way. This yeah. is the basketball case. Yeah, they looked at that specific case study and they stated that the board explicitly held that the fact that a research assistant's work might advance his own educational interest as well as the university's interest is not a barrier to finding a statutory employee status. So what they were saying here is they were looking at basketball players at Dartmouth and the argument that was being made was, well, these basketball players are benefiting. They're being trained and they're, they're, they're going out and getting an IL deal. Some of them might play pro, not very likely with Dartmouth players, but you never know, right? And the argument was they're benefiting from this. And the response that the NLRB had was, well, look, grad students, they benefit from the education they get, uh, teaching classes and things like that. That doesn't in any way make them not employees. That doesn't mean they don't get paid, right? Right. And it went on explaining that even if a person is compensated via a scholarship as opposed to hourly wages, that doesn't change the fact that the institution is controlling what they do in exchange for compensation. We're going to flash a quote up on the screen, but basically, like, regardless of what you are, if you're a grad student or an hourly paid worker, if the university has control over what you do, which is the case for, college, for, for these college athletes, athletes, uh, they are going to be employees, and we need that to happen with them. So the takeaway here is that the standard for being an employee under federal lo labor law is very simple. Do you perform work, and does the institution control that work? If so, you are an employee for most legal purposes. It doesn't matter whether they paid you wages before, although once you're determined to be an employee, they'll probably have to start. It, it doesn't matter whether you enjoy what you're doing or <laughs> if you would do it for free. Right. Uh, lots of people love their jobs, but it doesn't matter uh, that you're getting some benefit like free education. All that matters under the uh, NLRA is for everybody but student athletes, 
did you perform work and did they control what you did? Right, that's and the legal standard. That's the legal standard. And the answer for student athletes is the same as any other employee at the university for student workers in the bookstore to the president. Yes, they did. And yes, the institution controlled what they did and what they worked for. Thanks. So in the end, the argument here is pretty simple. What you do is say, look, look, judge, you don't even really have to make a value judgment here. All you have to do to vote pro is believe that rules should be consistently applied and that we shouldn't make random exceptions just because we would enjoy watching people play football and basketball and we want to pay less for it. Right? At the end of the day, if you agree that, the, look, the rule is, does the institute, do you work for the institution? Yes, they do. They clearly perform labor. Does the institution control you? Yes, they do. That is the rule for everybody else. Even if you personally don't love the idea of them getting paid, this is the rule we made for everybody else. So really, you would argue as the pro, the con needs to explain to you some justification for having this weird exception for why these people who are clearly working hard and clearly being controlled in their work, why should they not get the same employee classification as everybody else under existing labor and employment law. Which brings us to our last pro argument, unpaid student athlete labor exploits marginalized groups the most. So we already established that student athletes work without fair compensation, which is exploitative in general. But to make matters worse, the current system hurts the least advantaged most by exploiting marginalized groups. So this is from Michael A. Bongiovanni at Fordham University in 2020. He says 86% of collegiate athletes live below the federal poverty line. Although providing the opportunity for education is valuable, scholarships do not help athletes coming from poverty who are trying to help feed their family back home. And this goes to a point that Tanner hinted at earlier, which is that you can't eat a scholarship. Your family cannot live on a scholarship. And for many with aspirations of playing pro sports, you'll very likely never use any of the information that you learned under your scholarship. And remember how he says, said one size doesn't fit all. Well, that applies to the pro case too. The stereotype that every student athlete is on a full scholarship just isn't true. So this is from a blog by Grand Canyon University in 2023 about should college athletes be paid. And I'm not going to read all of this to you, but as you can see, many if not most student athletes do not get full scholarships. The vast majority for example of Division II scholarships which is like about a third of the entire NCAA are partial scholarships they're not a full ride or a full cost of to cost of attendance kind of things and number four here you see most college sports even at the D1 level don't offer full scholarships they're generally reserved for men's basketball and football as well as a few women's sports I can tell you for example baseball players here at Mississippi State by rule almost never get full scholarships even though they won the national championship a few years ago anyway this is all really good stuff for the pro in terms of like socioeconomics, but I think the real impact here comes from racial disparities. And specifically the idea that the status quo is effectively transferring wealth generated mainly by black athletes to teams and coaching staffs that mainly consist of white individuals from more affluent backgrounds. So this is from Craig Garthwaite of the National Bureau of Economic Research. We cited earlier, this is in 2020. And I'll read you the quote here. We find that the rent sharing, rent sharing just means the distribution of the money from college athletics. They call it rent sharing. That's a technical term. We find that the rent sharing effectively transfers resources away from students who are more likely to be black and more likely to come from poor neighborhoods towards students who are more likely to be white and come from higher income neighborhoods. The athletes generating the rents, again, rents is a technical term, just the money, right? The athletes generating the money who mainly play football and basketball are more likely to be black and come from lower income neighborhoods and the rents are shared with a set of athletes and coaches who are more likely to be white. Now to explain this in simple terms, imagine a typical college football team and a typical say college lacrosse team. Obviously there are going to be people from all different backgrounds on each team, but statistically the football team is likely to have more players who are black and more players from less privileged economic backgrounds. Meanwhile the lacrosse team is statistically more likely to have mostly white players and to have more players who grew up economically better off just based on the demographics of who plays the sport. Additionally, all of the coaches on both of the teams, including football, all of the teams are statistically more likely to be white and definitely better off economically. And if you want to visualize how stark this imbalance is, we're going to pop up some charts from Robert Binion and Mark Wood at Carnegie Mellon 
in 2022, but you can just see the massive disparity in terms of the percentage of black coaches versus players, right, uh, in certain sports in the NCAA in the first chart, and then the racial demographics of Division I college football coaches. It is overwhelmingly a white profession, e even in sports like college football, in which the percentage of players who are non-white or black is significantly higher. We have another chart here from NCAA research in 2016, and you can just see the disparities uh, between the numbers of head coaches and the number of student athletes in different sports. Uh, bottom line is, there are more white coaches and more black players. The black players are not getting paid, whereas the white coaches are, and a lot of the wealth is being transferred to student athletes in sports, again, like lacrosse and tennis and things like that, who are more likely to be predominantly white. This calls for marginalized groups. Basically, this resolution is just calling for these marginalized groups to get paid for what they're rightly entitled to. Right, and so you might be wondering, how much does this harm black athletes specifically? So there's a good estimate from Ted, and Ted Tados, weird names again, and Hall Singer uh, from the Antitrust Bulletin in 2021. And they say, quote, this article quantifies the NCAA's wealth transfer away from primarily black athlete labor to institutions and overwhelmingly white constituencies. Under the NCAA restraint, we estimate that black football and men and women's basketball athletes at the Division I Power Five conference level, it's a mouthful, have lost approximately $17 billion to $21 billion in compensation from 2005 to 2019. So roughly $1.2 to $1.4 billion per year. Tados and Singer elaborate further in an article in Global Sport Matters summarizing, the, summarizing their journal article saying, quote, to put this figure into perspective, depriving at black labor of a more competitive wage share amounts to an underpayment of approximately $250,000 a year for each and every black football or basketball athlete in a Power Five conference. This shows blatantly that these marginalized groups, specifically black Americans, who come from low-income areas, are being exploited for their labor, talent, and time. Again, the textbook, textbook definition of exploitation. And so with that, we will take a quick five-second break, at least in your world, and then we will come back and talk about the arguments on the con. Okay, we're coming down to the fourth quarter here, folks. The uh, real crunch time to see if we can pull out a big victory here for you. Sorry, I mean, you can't help but do the sports stuff. Okay, but we'll keep it serious from now on. It's time for con arguments. Uh, and on that, uh, I'll start things off with uh, number one, which is most athletes and schools don't generate profit. So the whole premise of the pro is that college athletics is generating these huge amounts of money and student athletes aren't getting their fair share. But the reality contradicts that. It's that college athletic departments lose money rather than making a profit. And while this isn't the be all end all argument, there are responses to it, it has an impact on the round. So let's talk about it. So according to Mark Drozdowski of Best Colleges in 2023, he writes, according to the NCAA, among the 65 autonomy, and these are just, that just means the top tier conference schools in Division I, only 25 recorded a positive net revenue in 2019. The situation isn't so rosy for Division I non-autonomy schools, and that just means the ones outside the big, what formerly was the Big Five conferences. There's really not five of them anymore, but um, outside of that, you have 64 institutions. Every single one of them lost money in 2019 with a median deficit of $23 million per school. Also in Division I is what you call the Football Championship Subdivision, or FCS. These are what we used to call 1AA programs, and they're the smaller Division I schools. All of them lost uh, money in 2019 with a median loss of $14.3 million per institution. Finally, uh, there's in Division I, you also have 97 schools without football programs. All of them had negative net revenue with a median loss of $14.4 million. And then finally, you have the NCAA Division II and III. These are the two smaller divisions that actually make up two-thirds of the schools. So most of the schools in the NCAA, all of them lost money as well. In other words, uh, of the 363 NCAA Division I schools, the 313 Division II schools, the 442 Division III schools, 1,100 institutions in total, a grand total of 25 of them made any profit at all in 2019, which is the last data that we have. In other words, 97% of them lost money on athletics. And if you want a really good school-by-school -school summary on this, you can check out this piece by Dr. Scott Hirko on his LinkedIn blog. Uh, but it is, he seems to be an authoritative guy with good data. This is from 2022. And as you can see, he reaches slightly different conclusions than the Drozdowski piece. He finds that uh, 18 schools made a profit as opposed to 25, but his numbers are very similar. He has this really nice chart here where you can look and see the actual amount of profit or loss 
that these schools had in their athletic departments. You can see number 16 there, Mississippi State barely made a profit. But then after number 18, every single school, school you see is losing money. And that goes on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of entries in Division I alone. Now to be fair, this doesn't end the discussion. And we know that because there are plenty of businesses, like we said, and plenty of government agencies that lose money and they still have to pay their employees. And as we talked about on the pro, even if an athletic department loses money, it may still generate value. But what these statistics do accomplish is to undermine the pro's narrative that there are all these student athletes out there who deserve to get rich because they're funding these athletic departments that are just rolling in cash and can easily afford to pay them. For the vast majority of colleges and universities, this narrative is simply not true. The Michigan or Alabama football programs may have tens or hundreds of millions of dollars sitting around to pay players, but I guarantee you the Division III women's lacrosse program uh, down the street does not. These programs lose money, just like the college debate team loses money. We don't make a profit. The choir does not make a profit. They barely scrape by uh, these like lacrosse teams and tennis teams at Division III uh, colleges. They barely scrape by staying in budget motels when they travel. They play in front of a few dozen people. They play mainly for the benefit of the players, not for the fans. And all of a sudden you said, hey, listen, the federal government just decided that you're all employees. It's going to require that we pay you all the minimum wage plus one and a half times that for overtime because you're employees. Do you know what a lot of those teams would do? They would shut down. The Tougaloo College or Millsaps College in Jackson, they cannot afford to pay every member of their soccer team or their volleyball team or even their football team. And if you suddenly said, hey, listen, the federal government has decided that all of you at this Division III college are now employees and we're going to have to pay you the minimum wage for all the hours you practice and play and probably for when you travel. And then we're also going to have to pay your overtime, which is time and a half of that number, uh, because you are employees. Do you know what a lot of these smaller schools would do? They would shut these programs down. Tougaloo College or Millsaps College in Jackson, Mississippi cannot afford to pay every member of their soccer team or their volleyball team or even their football team. And the minute you decide that they are employer, uh, employees under the Fair Labor Standards Act in particular, these schools are going to have no choice but to shut down a big portion, if not the entirety of their athletics program. This is summed up nicely by Bridget Shanley in 2014. She says another concern the Northwestern University football players, and that was a case back in 2014 about paying players, did not consider was the cost of classifying student athletes as employees for their student athlete peers in other sports and the athletic program itself. Universities may discontinue funding losing teams that cost more money to run than bring in revenue in order to shift focus and funds to high revenue teams. There's another article here from Kristen Merkel uh, from the law firm Montgomery McCracken in 2023. And it says, and this is about the Johnson case we talked about earlier uh, in the background section in the Third Circuit. So what it says, in the case currently before the Third Circuit, Johnson versus NCAA, the group of Division I student athletes led by former Villanova defensive back Ralph Trey Johnson are asking the court to determine whether D1 student athletes should be considered employees under the Fair Labor Standards Act. A ruling in the plaintiff's favor would require colleges and universities to pay student athletes minimum wage and overtime pay. This raises the question of how pay would be distributed to the athletes as well as how resources would be allocated to different programs. Many have signaled that increased payroll costs would result in the reduction of rosters for many sports teams or the cutting of certain sports programs entirely and consequently would lead to further inequalities than already exist in college athletics. NCAA President Charlie Baker cautioned that athletic programs at the Division II and III schools might cease to exist without congressional action. He added that athlete representatives from all three divisions in the NCAA have signaled that they do not want to be classified as employees. In other words, if you want to frame it in very common sense terms for the judge, you might say that employee status is a solution that is meant for a few very high profile programs, a few very top tier players and programs across the country that ignores the practical needs of the vast majority of college athletes who aren't at the most elite, most profitable programs. If a small number of NCAA athletes in certain sports at big name schools stand to benefit, but many others will be hurt by it, what's the solution? Well, the con would say the solution the solution is to negate the resolution because, as we said earlier, it provides a one-size-fits-all answer that doesn't actually benefit the vast majority of folks. It doesn't benefit the thousands and thousands and thousands of Division II and Division III athletes who are never going to generate revenue, and if they have to be paid a minimum wage under the law, their programs will simply shut down. So instead of a single broad brush approach, we should look to the case-by-case -case alternative. Right. The affirmation not only has to advocate that every single college which feels 
field student athletes would have to pay up. They also have to argue that every single athlete must be paid. Right. The truth is, not all sports are football and basketball. There's lots of others. Here at Mississippi State, we have plenty of other athletic teams like golf, tennis, track, volleyball, etc. These sports offer tens of thousands of dollars worth of tuition, housing, meal plans, etc. for these students, even though they do not generate profit or really even any re revenue at all. When it comes to classifying students as employees, we have to take fair compensation into account. If a sport is making millions off of its athletes, then fine, we should pay them. But if a sport is only a drain on the university's budget, I don't see why a free education wouldn't be a fair compensation. So basically the argument here is to say, look, Judge, the alternative to the resolution is not a world where nobody gets paid. It's a world where we look case by case and ask if this particular team, this particular athlete, this particular program would be a good fit for being treated as an employee. Right? The, the resolution requires that we take a one-size-fits-all approach and basically, as Tanner says, pay everybody. Our response is, is simple. We don't necessarily disagree with the Ohio State football program getting paid, right? But they could get paid in a lot of ways. They could get paid through NIL. We'll talk about some other alternatives about how they could get paid in other ways. But this rule, making everybody an employee, is going to result in a handful of already, you know, fairly well-off athletes or potentially well-off athletes getting the benefits while everybody else has the existence of their program program put at risk because we simply can't afford to pay Division Three lacrosse players. Right? right. And this isn't some crazy idea made up for a public forum. It's actually current law. Like we said, Michael McCann, like we brought up at the very beginning, he actually answered a question of can some of these student athletes be paid as employees, whereas others aren't paid as employees? Right. He, he said yes. He, and right here, it we're flashed up on the screen. Yes, a petition before a court or administrative agency that only concerns the potential employment of athletes on one team, uh, such as the men's basketball team, or a few teams, like men's basketball team, Team, the women's basketball team and the football team would only concern those athletes. Athletes on other teams at a school could argue they too should be recognized employees, but unless the school conference or NCAA has the employer a a agree, these athletes would need to pursue empl employment recognition through the law and insist they similarly situate. In other words, bottom line, every individual team would be just just like the Dartmouth case, right? Mm -hmm. In the Dartmouth case, we see a single team at Dartmouth petitioned the National Labor Relations Board to be recognized. All of the other teams at Dartmouth did not do that. So right now, they will not be forming unions. So mm -hmm. what is going on in the status quo is we are going case by case. Some potential employees who want to be treated as employees can make that case. Others cannot. We do not need a broad brush rule, right? Right, and this makes absolute sense. Not every store, uh, not every sport is the same. Court gains, uh, they actually, here's a good graph here. It can show that there's a ton of revenue for football and basically not a lot for everything else <laughs> besides uh, basketball. But as you can see very well, college football is basically printing money. <laughs> I mean, like right. 30, $32 million. I mean, this is, I mean, it's insane. Uh, but the bottom line, of the, uh, bottom line of this chart is that you see that the rest of these sports, which makes hundreds of thousands on average, uh, you cannot see that the university's softball team is exploiting athletes with a straight face. Uh, if anything, athletes are exploiting the university's athletic budget for a free education. Uh, and just compare the data with fair market values of college football or basketball athletes that we referenced earlier. So the bottom line is that a one-size-fit-all approach does not work. We have to look case by case. Uh, and what we can see is this, this leads straight to our next point, which is uh, reducing educational opportunities at smaller institutions. And, and this argument is pretty simple. Remember how we told you on the pro that this would have a disparate impact on the least advantaged student athletes, that allowing for these programs to pretty much extract money from them would disadvantage them? Well, we can turn that. So we can show you a world where attempting to provide benefits for those student athletes, paying them the federal student wa federal minimum student wage, or allowing them to unionize, would actually hurt those schools who are the most disadvantaged and students who are the most disadvantaged, who need these scholarships to actually be able to show up to school and get a college degree. According to the NCAA in 2024, NCAA, uh, the NCAA Divisions 1 and 2 schools provide more than $3.6 billion in athletic scholarships annually to more than 180,000 student athletes. And the important thing is that these scholarships are extremely important because a vast majority of student athletes come from families that live below the federal poverty line. That is, without these scholarships, they would not be at school. Right. According to Fordham University in 2020, they say that, quote, 86%, and this is the same source from earlier, 86% of collegiate athletes live below the federal poverty line or come from families that are from the, fe the federal poverty line. And listen, while a lot of that text seems like a scathing attack on schools for not paying athletes, the reality that it acknowledges is very stark. 
Hundreds of thousands of student athletes come from destitution. To put things simply, they would not be in college were it not from these scholarships. And let me be clear about what we're saying here, just in very practical terms. On the pro, we told you that we're transferring money from these teams that are more likely to have black student athletes on them to uh, white coaches and things like that. And that was the story of like the disparities there. In this case, on the con, we're going to turn that around and say, like, look, if you tell, let's just say, for example, Tougaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi, which is an HBCU, a historically black college and university, if they, they operate a shoestring budget. Their athletics are very small, as you might expect for a small school like that. If you tell them that they are going to have to pay a minimum wage to every single student athlete, they simply cannot afford to do that. They're already on the hook, as Devin talked about, for part of these billions of dollars in scholarships. If now, in addition to that, they have to start paying you know, the minimum wage every time they have a practice, they can't do it. So what's going to happen is these scholarship slots, these openings for students to go to Tougaloo College, which by the way, overwhelmingly go to students of color. In many cases, they go to lower income students, not all the time, but in many cases they do, right? They're going to go away. So we're going to completely turn the pros impact of hurting minorities and hurting disenfranchised and disadvantaged people by saying what you're really going to do is completely destroy the educational opportunities that many of these people would be getting in places like Tougaloo and other small colleges and things like that. Right, and those opportunities would go away because, because the costs are astronomically high. And this is according to Elena K. Follick in uh, Beyond Amateurism, saying, quote, the, uh, paying them for all the athletic hours, paying athletes for all the athletic hours that they report during the season and for eight hours per week during the off season would be significantly more expensive than what the NCAA currently spends on athletic student aid. They say, quote, one, it is $1 billion higher than actual current costs. So that is, paying student athletes would cost $4.6 billion. Couple this with the numbers we've already provided you with on just how financially strained most institutions are, then we have the perfect storm. Students wishing to play for schools that aren't Michigan or Bama will simply just not be able to attend school. Yeah, right. Like So Michigan, Alabama, even Mississippi State, they can walk off their share of that extra billion dollars, definitely. But again, small schools that make up the vast majority of these educational opportunities, they can't. And huge numbers of scholarship spots on these rosters of these smaller teams are going to go away because they can't just absorb their share of another billion dollars in cost, right? And that brings us to the last big point on the con, which is that... It will create massive gender disparities. Right. So as a rule, collegiate men's teams generate more revenue than women's teams. Only a relative, uh, only a relative handful of teams in the NCAA generate, generate a new profit, and nearly all of them are in two sports. It's men's basketball and football. Just look back at the charts that we provided earlier. Men's basketball and football dwarf any women's sports. If student athletes are treated as employees, we can expect the normal principles of employment to apply, with those who earn more being paid more. In the case of the highest profile universities, this would mean football and men's basketball players potentially being paid an order of magnitude more than their counterparts in women's sports. In fact, Given the case-by-case -case nature of employee, employee status, it could very well mean that men's teams get paid well while women's teams don't get paid at all. Those disparities in treatment are currently illegal under Title IX, which is a law that prohibits gender discrimination in higher education. But paying students would absolutely complicate the spirit of Title IX protections. Jobs and Sports, they talked about this, and they stated that paying college athletes would likely mean a greater emphasis on revenue-generating sports, which are predominantly male-dominated, like football and basketball. This shift could uh, lead to a widening gap uh, in resources and opportunities for female athletes, ultimately undermining the spirit of intent and intent of Title IX. Again, just look back at the figures we provided on fair market value for male football and basketball players. Schools would have to cough up hundreds of thousands of dollars just to compensate and keep their male athletes. And in absolutely wild cases, star athletes would be vying for millions when deciding which school to play for. And while women collegiate athletes are starting to feel uh, the love through NIL uh, and the, the disparities uh, will continue to persist, NIL gives a good indication that exactly a fair market employment system might look like, which is not looking good for the ladies in sports. Uh, Vanessa McGee, as she, sta she states uh, in 2023, that men co college athletes receive 66% of deals from NIL collectives. That means just 34% of women's sport athletes are paid through college NIL deals, which is a huge discrepancy. Right, and employment would look just as bad as this does. In, in fact, it would probably look worse. 
Whereas Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, and Livy Dunn are able to ink million dollar NIL deals because of their social media presence or downright basketball talent, employment would peg compensation to the actual value produced by athletes on the field or on the court. Right. And you know, what is even more dangerous to Title IX is the prospect of unionization. Even if compensation wasn't initially pegged to the value of the program, the, pri the right to unionize would guarantee its eventuality. Male football and basketball players would, would easily be able to unionize across the nation and demand significant amounts of compensation, better amenities, or more scholarships, all based on the massive amount of money that male sports produce. And in this case, employee rights in Title IX would run into direct conflict. David J. Santasino, or Santasenio, whatever his name is, uh, in 2015 writes, quote, a unionized football team could force the institution to negotiate over better locker rooms, better practice facilities, better travel accommodations and meal plans, or additional medical training support. In addressing those, the, those demands, the institution would have to evaluate carefully whether its football program was receiving unequal benefits compared to other teams, right. most specifically the women's teams. In a practical sense, the institution would then potentially be forced either to provide additional benefits to its women's teams to balance the benefits it was providing to men's football or accept that its athletic program was likely out of compliance with Title IX and bear the consequences. And let's be clear about what we're talking about here, okay? In the status quo, in a world where we have student athletes who are not employees, we can have a law like Title IX that says you have to basically treat men and women the same. They get the same scholarships. In places like Mississippi State, they can get some small cost of living payments, which are not wages, but they can get enough to you know, pay, pay for their food and things like that. But they get the same thing, okay? Maybe under this model that uh, the NCAA president has proposed, you could do the same thing. You could have more or less equal distribution consistent with Title IX. But in a world where we pay people wages based upon their market value, that's not gonna be the same. And particularly, as Devin says, when we start unionizing. Remember, these teams aren't gonna unionize all together. I can guarantee you the football players at a Power Five conference are not gonna unionize with the women's lacrosse players because they know that their bargaining position is much stronger and that unionizing with the women, frankly, would just water it down. So they're gonna have a football players union, right? And then they may also have a women's volleyball or water polo or whatever union, but the football union is gonna have a lot more power. And they're gonna be able to sit down with the athletic department and say, look, you make this much revenue. You've been distributing it over to these other teams. We don't want you to do that. We want you to pay it to us. And if you don't, we're all gonna hit the transfer portal and leave. Or we're gonna, you know, basically boycott. We're not gonna show up for games and things like that. That is gonna create a system, a situation where you really have no choice economically, but to take away money that currently is distributed equitably to women and instead distributed overwhelmingly to the people who have the bargaining power in a world where they are treated as employees and that's going to overwhelmingly be the men's teams. Mm -hmm. So that is what we've got on the con. It's a little more complicated in terms of the economics of it, but I do think the one size does not fit all argument works pretty well. And so with that, we will come back in just a second with some final thoughts. Okay, let's do some really quick final thoughts on this really fun sports topic for March of 2024. Tanner, go. Yes, I got two. So the first is going to be keep it simple. Uh, as the pro, you got to define what the employee is. Uh, like we said in the framework, the NLRB, uh, use that as kind of a framework of saying, like, this is what we're going to define the employee as. I do they have control of your work, things like that. Uh, what we're trying to advocate for the pros is like we just want these players to be able to negotiate. And what the con's going to try to do is throw all these very difficult things that, well, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. But the pro just has to come up and keep it simple and say, hey, look, we just want these players to be able to negotiate what they want. Like if they want better, you know, physical therapists, like they should have the ability to say, hey, I want to have better, better physical therapists. And that's it. Yeah. And just keep it very simple, very succinct. And the second is going to be what are the implications of these actions? Like in theory, like, yeah, paying these players sounds fantastic. It's wonderful. But again, Again, consider those implications and then like learn how to like prioritize those. It's like, yeah, this might happen, but it's going to have a less impact compared to this or whatever it is. So this kind of reminds me of a couple of a couple months back talking about like re relieving student loan debt. It's like know what the implications are uh, and know how to prioritize those. But keep it simple and know what the implications are to your actions. Yeah, I think Tanner's right. I think that on the pro, if you can just say, look, we're not going to get into all this complicated stuff about the economics and the exact cost. All we're saying is, just like in the Dartmouth case, we want the NLRB rule to be basically be that these people are employees, 
They can bargain collectively for what's in their best interest. And look, if some proposal, like if they want a million dollars to go play, you know, uh, tennis at a Division three school, they're not going to be able to bargain for that. Mm -hmm. So, Judge, don't worry about all these nightmare scenarios that the con is telling you that these teams are going to go out of business. All you're going to be doing is giving them the ability to collectively come to the table, form a union if they want to, and if that's what they want to do, then they can do it, and all these nightmare scenarios won't come to pass. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, both hard acts to follow. I think they covered everything that I would want to say, so I will just say that I'm a convert, and I very much like the topic, uh, and it's a lot better than I originally uh, had seen it. Uh, I think it's a lot more complex, and I would just say have fun while you have the topic about sports. So with that, we have finished up yet another topic in an interesting year of PF Topics this year. <laughs> want to thank Devin, want to thank Tanner, great job as always, and uh, we will see you back next time here on uh, the channel. Just remember, as we always say here, debate is for everybody, so work hard, have fun, and hail safe.